The following video is brought to you in part by the amazing Patreon producers you see before you. If you'd like to show your support, you can do so at patreon.com slash 616 entertainment. Your support means the world to me, and I love you so much. Now let's get to it. What's up, Dan Dans? Welcome to Mortal Kombat Monday. My name is Ian. A couple weeks ago on this channel, I read chapters 1 through 4 of the Mortal Kombat novel written by Jeff Rovin. This book is terribly written, it's horrible, and I don't recommend any of you spend a dime on it. And that's why I'm recording this god-awful, dog-shit audiobook for your listening pleasure. I'm gonna be honest here, I fully expected that first video to eat shit. I didn't think anybody would care about the idea, but I was wrong. Very wrong. 99% of the comments asked me to keep going, and because of that, here we are. Fair warning though, that first video where I read chapters 1 through 4 had me laughing at how bad the writing was. This video where I read chapters 5 through 8 has me legitimately upset and very angry at how garbage this thing is. So if you like the videos where I get very upset, this one's for you. Now without further ado, no more delays, let's jump right into it and get this over with as quick as possible. Okay, Dan Dan, so we're about to jump into chapter 5. I can't believe we're only on page 39, so I hope you're caught up. I hope you watched that first installment of me reading this terrible book so you know what happened in chapters 1 through 4. Here's the thing, that first video was over a month ago at this point. I haven't looked at, read, or even thought about this book since I did that first video. So I don't remember how to do any of the voices. I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> We're gonna jump right in here. And there are two characters talking right at the opening of chapter five, and I don't know who they are, because they haven't told me, but I guess we're gonna find out. Here we go. You signed up for this, you clicked play, all right? So now you're in. Another one, yes, Lord. Not one we have already seen. Not another failure, no, Lord. You're sure, yes, Lord. <laughs> I can't fucking, who are these people? <laughs> Oh, fuck. I'm already, I'm already punch drunk here. A nearly invisible hand reached out and grabbed the little yellow demon by one horn. It lifted the portly, struggling imp into the air, his little feet and sharp-nailed toes kicking out from under his red robe. Very sure. What? Why, why didn't they set the scene? I don't know who's who. How the fuck am I supposed to know who's the voice of the yellow imp and who's the other... This book sucks. <laughs> yes, Lord, the demon said with all the authority he could muster. Okay, so now I know that the non-italicized words are from the demon. I'm gonna fucking, I, I, why am I doing this? <laughs> the demon said with all the authority he could muster, which wasn't much at the moment. His big, cloud-white eyes opened wider, reflecting the fires that burned on the rocks and waters, in the caves and pits around them. Lord, I saw him and believe that this is the one, the one you sent, not one of the deluded pretenders. <laughs> I, s I can't keep straight who the characters are, guys, I'm sorry. The fierce, unthinkably old Shao Kahn, Lord of the Outworld. This is Shao Kahn I'm reading right now, and that's the voice they have me doing because they didn't tell me. Master of the Furies and King of the Dark Arts brought the writhing demon nearer. Ruthe. That's, I'll do Shao Kahn, kind of growly. He said in a voice that was deep and searingly hot, The son of my sister. Do you know what I will do if you are wrong? Beads of bloody sweat erupted on the demon's parchment-thin yellow flesh. He folded his trembling hands together and held them in supplication. Yes, Lord, you will. Will. A blast of white came from the mouth of the dark shape that was the demon lord. This is, this is terrible <laughs> The thin, fair cloud touched Ruthay's long-fingered hands and turned their skin blue. Turned their skin blue? The thin, fair cloud touched Ruthay's long-fingered hands and turned their skin blue. Okay. The hands stopped shaking as the icy breath froze them together. I will freeze you, Regent Ruthay and then cage you over a slow flame and allow you to melt. When you are a puddle, I will take away the fire and leave you a spineless, immobile mass for all eternity. 
Shao Kahn bent close, his black eyes glowing the dullest, deepest red. I repeat, are you sure? He, 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 Ruthay swallowed hard. He is in the t temple of Sh Shimura, l Lord. This, th th that is the fucking worst, but that's how it's written. I'm just reading it for you how it's written. Why am I doing this? <laughs> the Demon King's eyes blackened again. There was a hint of pointed yellow teeth as he breathed hotly at Ruthay's hands, thawing them, and the trace of a smile as the giant monarch set his regent on the ground. So we're going to stop real quick. Shao Kahn has ice breath and fire breath in this book, which is very interesting. Jumping back in. The sound of a massive but unseen cloak rustling filled the titanic valley as the evil lord sat back. Red light from the countless fires dimly lit a throne. Hone? Hoon? H-E-W-N. I've never seen that fucking word in my life. The dimly lit throne honed from the face of the valley wall. Get out of the way, Shao Kahn demanded. Ruth A. modded... I'm gonna fucking kill myself. <laughs> Oh, this is so much worse than the first video. Who the fuck is Ruthay? Ruthay nodded vigorously and bowed as he stepped back. Red perspiration ran in long, raining rivers as he watched the hard, cracked ground in front of him. The King of Darkness stirred, raising an arm that was silhouetted against the red flame behind it and was fully thrice the size of Ruthay's body. A powerful finger was extended, and a tongue of flame flew from the long, hooked nail. It struck the ground and a pool of flame appeared, the size of Ruthay's fat, terrified face. In the midst of the flame was a tiny, kneeling figure, dark dust of a man whom Ruthay could barely see. The regent looked from the moat to the demonic ruler, whose dark eyes were once more reddening. Ruthay's robe was drenched with sweat and twice as heavy as before. If Shao Kahn didn't speak soon, the regent would be a puddle even if he were right, even if this were the mortal form of the demon who had been sent through the rift five centuries before. That breach had been created by some fool named Amotep, who stumbled upon the right words but not quite the right formula of a lifetime, after a lifetime of trying. I'm reading these words and saying them out loud and I cannot picture what the fuck they're saying. Which I'm gonna blame the book, not me. <laughs> Mummy dust instead of bone powder, Ruthay thought with a shake of his round head. The bulging red muscle of which was visible beneath his tight flesh. The foolishness of humans. Now, see now, you guys can't see it, but I'm reading the book, see? That's me running my finger over the page. Now they have Ruthay's words italicized, but not in quotes. And that directly goes against what they did before where Shao Kahn's quotes are italicized. So now they're fucking with me and they're doing it on purpose. This, the, the layout of this book is my fucking balls. It's the worst. The sleek blue-black lips of the Devil King pulled into what was now most definitely a smile. Shang, he said. I wondered what became of you. You were sent away ten human lifetimes ago. Though the tiny figure spoke in an even smaller voice, Ruthay turned a small, knob-like ear toward the ground and was able to hear his answer. I... I remember nothing. I'm, I guess I'm gonna do Shang Tsung in more of like an old guy now, because he's old. Where before, I think I was doing him like this. I'm changing it. Fuck it. You remembered, Shao Kahn rumbled at the still-kneeling bug man. In dreams, each time your mortal form died, you took some of what he had learned with you. This learning came to you while you slept. As I planned. You planned? I, <laughs> these voices! Shang said, I, Am I... He paused, as though he couldn't quite grasp what was happening. Am I in the outworld, Lord Khan? Ruthay smiled, partly because the little being was so pathetic, but more because the creature had remembered the master's name. He was the one. The Lord wouldn't punish him. What he was the one, semicolon, the Lord wouldn't punish him. So what the book is trying to say is that Ruth A is thinking he was the one. But it's all italicized, so they can't italicize just one and stress that. There's no point for a semicolon to be there. 
And then it says, the Lord wouldn't punish him. It doesn't follow up with, he thought. It's just, we're supposed to put this all together. God damn it. Ruthay had already been contemplating what eternity would be like on the bottom of a cage. Shao Kahn's dark eyes reddened. You are at the foot of the throne of Outworld, Khan boomed. Before the master of death and the Shokan regions of magic. You were my regent, Shang. A bold and trusted figure sent on a mission. Yes, said Shang. A mission to open a portal between the realms. To enable you to send the demon hordes through and conquer the mother realm. That is correct, Shao Kahn said, his smile widening, the sharp teeth glistening with bloody spittle. Ponku never intended for things to be thus. <laughs> oh, I love that. He, Shao Kahn goes from just talking normally to like ye old English here. God damn it. For there to be two realms, his body formed the one, and the death that left his body formed another, our realm. Life and death must be joined so that all dualities may end. There must be only one way in the cosmos. There must be only my way. <coughs> oh, that voice hurts. It hurts. <laughs> I remember everything now, Lord, said Shang. But I have failed you. This portal, he spread his arms wide, is not large enough. I, I made it for this miserable human form I inhabit. A laugh bubbled from somewhere deep inside the Titan. You haven't failed me, Shao Kahn replied. Using your small human mind and form, you have made a beginning. A late one, he said, but a good one. <laughs> what must I do, Shang asked. Shao Kahn bent closer. You must collect souls. They are the remnants of Pan Ku's spirit, divided and weakened but repairable. You must find a way to gather them on the island. Use them to enlarge the portal. The Demon King's eyes were a swirling mass of black and red as they shifted and fell on his regent. As they shifted and fell on his regent? God damn it. The chubby demon bowed again and quivered. Come here, Shao Kahn commanded. Yes, Lord. I don't remember what fucking voice I was using for the, de for the little guy now. <laughs> The smaller demon moved on flat, thick feet toward his master. As he neared, great, unseen hands grabbed him around the waist and held him above the small circle. Shang, said Shao Kahn. I will send Ruthway. Ruthway? I added a W. Take two. I will send Ruthay through the opening you have made to show you how to use the souls you collect. You will dwell inside the circle you have drawn at your feet and will be able to help you in other matters as well. The giant released the demon, who fell into the flames and roared with agony as he became one with them. Then, the Dark Lord opened his hand and passed it over the sea of fire that blazed around Shang Tsung. The flames writhed and died and the smoke rolled away from the demon, in mortal form. Five centuries ago, said Shao Kahn, I sent you to that island in a sea of fire, and it has been shrouded in fog ever since. Now the mists are thick again. Let them hide what you do there. Hide it from the eyes of the children of the Mother Realm. <coughs> God damn. My throat's gonna hurt tomorrow. The ends of the Devil's King mouth... The ends of the Devil King's mouth turned down. I will always be watching, but you will not be able to see me. However long you take, there will be those who try to stop you. The monks and priests of the Order of Light will oppose you, as they did me when they constructed that temple. The god spawn of Tien, my brother, will try to stop you. And one and one there is a mere okay, we're gonna just we're gonna say it the way it's written. And one there is a mere mortal who has been taken in by the Thunder God to spread lies about the dignity of worms and humans. To oppose you. I don't know what that sentence was trying to say. Shao Kahn's eyes burned fully red as he gazed down at his servant. If you fail me, if you allow them to stop you, my retribution will be as bitter as it will be everlasting. Do you understand, Shang Tsung? I understand, Lord Khan. I am determined to succeed, not to preserve myself, but to serve you. 
The giant's mouth smiled once more. I did right to select you, my one-time regent. Do what I have asked and your reward will be a princedom. Rule over the Shokan regions and all the magic thereof. And then Shao Kahn frowned again. Remember, though, that to keep the portal between the realms open, as I command you must, it will cost human souls. If they are not souls, you... you <coughs> God damn it. Let's take that again. If they are not souls you have won, then a piece of your own soul must be sacrificed to keep it from closing. Time has very little meaning to me, and I will be patient with you, but not forever. You have only one... <laughs> Fuck. You... <laughs> You have <laughs> Oh, we got this. We got this. You have only until this mortal form dies to succeed. With that, the hands pressed once more over Shang Tsung, and the giant sat back, a still but living shadow in a world of flame. Holy fuck. <laughs> I want to stop this video right there. Jesus Christ. <laughs> That was very taxing, mentally and physically. But we're not going to stop there. It's Mortal Kombat Monday. We're going on to Chapter 6. Oh my god, how is that only 8 pages? <laughs> this book is making me lose my mind. Oh man, I'm going off the deep end. Here we go, Chapter 6. <laughs> how strange it was, Kung Lao thought as he finished his morning prayers and sat cross-legged on the cliff. Savoring the cold air of pre-dawn, his hands pressed together under his chin, thumbs up, his eyes shut. That was all one sentence! Why did that have to be one sentence? <sighs> to have been brought here because of my mind and spirit, yet to be renowned for 15 years because of my strength and martial arts skills. That's not a full sentence! To have been brought here because of my mind and spirit, Yet to be renowned for 15 years because of my strength and martial arts skills, period. No, 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 no. Because of my strength and martial arts skills, comma, then what? It's getting worse. This book is getting worse. There it was, as always, the duality of things. Though in every way, this one had turned out stranger than most. It didn't seem as though it had been a decade and a half since he had first set eyes on Raiden. So now, 15 years have passed from chapter 4. I guess chapter 5 took 5 fucking years. 15 years to go. <laughs> Let's take that again. It didn't seem as though it had been a decade and a half since he had first set eyes on Raiden. Or, at least, the 7 foot tall human shape the fearsome thunder god had assumed when he descended from the clouds around Mount Ikef Ifakube to move among mortals. <laughs> Kung Lao used to wonder what Raiden must look like in his mortal form, whether it was the single great lightning bolt that had first carried him past the caves of the priest to the realm of the gods, or whether it was all lightning everywhere. Now, it didn't seem to matter. What was important was not how Raiden appeared, but how noble his spirit was, the character and strength that showed itself each year at this time, when he came as flesh and blood to fight. And fight he did, Kung Lao thought, with his famed lightning throws, his airborne torpedo attack, and the ability to teleport. This motherfucker, <laughs> Jeff Rovin, the guy who wrote the book, was he played Mortal Kombat 1, clearly, because those are all Raiden's moves. <laughs> the same talent that had enabled him to come and go and watch over Kung Lao for all those years back in Chu Zheng. Opening his eyes just moments before the red orb of the sun rose over the distant horizon, the Order of Light Monk, the most honored priest of them all, rose smoothly from, rose smoothly from the ground without using his hands or knees, but just the strength of his legs. His pure white robes stirring in the gentle breeze, he held his arms toward the rising sun as it shaded from the bright orange to the golden to the yellow. That's a terrible sentence. He remembered the gold of Raiden's eyes the first time he'd seen them, how there had been warmth and the icy fire in them, the sun and the moon in one being, the duality. In this case, though, there were the legacy of Panku, the god whose body became the earth, sun, and moon. That's not a full sentence. I can't, I can't even fucking, I want to rip this book to pieces. <laughs> 
<sighs> Alone among the gods, Raiden carried the memory of the parent god. Even Tien did not have the knowledge that Raiden did. And then Raiden passed it on to him. At the spot just behind him, the temple of the thunder god on the eastern peaks of Mount Ifukube. What the fuck are you saying? And then Raiden passed it on to him. Who's him? Pronouns, pal. Who's him? Kung Lao? Are we talking about Kung Lao? At the spot just behind him, the temple of the thunder god on the eastern peaks of Mount Ifukube. What happened there? That's not a complete sentence. That's a spot. The spot just behind him, and then they explain it. It's the fucking Thunder God Temple at Mount Ifukube. What happened there? God damn it. It's it's going from like being funny to making me really mad. <laughs> For nearly a year, beneath ceilings of frozen lightning, they sat on chairs of solid gold, behind pillars carved from the mountain face by ancient monks, and the god had passed on all that he knew about Panku. In the event that anything ever happened to him, the Thunder God wanted the origin of the world to be known to someone. Someone who would grasp the magnitude of the tale and who would teach it to others. Someone who would elevate the monks and priests who heard it and inspire them to carry the tale to others. If anything ever happened to Raiden, Kung Lao mused. That's not a fucking complete sentence! If anything ever happened to Raiden, Kung Lao mused. What did he muse? <sighs> I feel like the first video of me reading this book was funny because I stumbled on words and I was like, this book isn't so good. But now it's so bad that it's making me look stupid. And I really wish you guys had the book in front of you and were following along so you could see what I see. If anything ever happened to Raiden, Kung Lao mused. That's... It's not a... It's, that's not how sentence structure works. This guy got this book published. This book was in stores. It's got a nice cover. It's fucking glossy and it's embossed. I'm gonna write a dog shit book and get it published. Would you guys buy it? I bet people bought this piece of shit. Fucking hell. We're gonna take that part again. <laughs> If anything ever happened to Raiden, Kung Lao mused. It was possible, wasn't it? Especially now that the horror was upon them. The horror of evil that had to exist wherever it was good. They didn't even say what he fucking mused. If anything ever happened to Raiden, Kung Lao mused. It was possible, wasn't it? What, that something would happen to him? Especially now that the horror was upon them. I can't even, I can't do this. When the sun was fully up, it warmed the head from which Kung Lao had long ago shaved his youthful cue. It warmed the cheeks that still felt his aunt's touch, despite the years they had been apart. Years during which he'd yearned to go to her, but knew he could not. For his old life was dead. She would only have wanted for him to stay, and that he could not do. But most of all, the sun warmed the amulet Kung Lao wore around his neck. A smooth white orb set in a gleaming, ever-changing golden shape suspended from a simple leather necklace. The amulet had been forged by Raiden ages before and given to him by the high priest of the Order of Light, who told him that it was a piece of the sun and a piece of the moon, the two dichotomous parts of Panku. This mother fucker can't form a complete sentence, and he drops dichotomous when describing this sentence that is built from a piece of the sun and a piece of the moon. This motherfucker sent this book out and it got edited by his wife or somebody smarter than him with a better vocabulary. And you know what? I bet it was his wife. And I bet she was just scanning through this book and was like, oh, this, honey, this is very good. But she didn't have the heart to tell that to him. She, she's a good woman. She doesn't want to put her fucking husband down. He's following his dreams. You know what I mean? So she's like, what if you just slide this word in there? And she gives him a fucking four-syllable word for his dog shit book. <sighs> Let's get back to it. <laughs> oh, my God. The high priest had presented Kung Lao with the amulet when they brought him to their caves and took over his training when Raiden was through. 
He spent his second year on the mountain among them, subsisting on broth and bread in the fire-warmed caves and learning that these holy men were not like their brethren in villages like Shuzhang. They were genuinely spiritual, interested in study and knowledge, not in controlling the populace through fear and ritual. The second year was devoted to Kung Lao's indoctrination into the Order of Light, his first exposure to the collected writings of scholars and holy figures from different eras from around the world, and his introduction to the daunting, exhilarating, mystical ordeal of mortal combat, the great tournament held in Shaolin temples on the slopes of Mount Takahashi on the island of Shimura in the East China Seas. Guys, that was one fucking sentence. There is no punctuation. That was one sentence. I'm not going to read it again. Moving on. At the beginning of his third year, Kung Lao had come back to the Temple of Thunder. The Temple of the Thunder God to punch. Here's what I'm wondering now, before we even get any further. They just went from like, oh, his first year, his second year. Let me tell you more about his second year. You know, in his third year, 15 years have passed. Are we going to go through all fucking 15 of them? At the beginning of the third year, Kung Lao had come back here to the Temple of the Thunder God to ponder one by one the writings of the philosophers and martial artists collected by the high priests, to reflect on and write about the saga of Pan Ku, and to record his own thoughts on scrolls. Through the priests, he dispersed these writings to the pilgrims who came to worship, advising them on everything from spirituality to medicine to art. They, in turn, brought them to the temples that had become corrupted by the local politics and petty disagreements that had lost sight of the goals of the Order of Light. There was also another task Kung Lao would have, one which Raiden had mentioned but never explained, and Kung Lao knew better than to press him. When the Thunder God was ready to tell him about it, then he would know. Only once a year did Kung Lao venture from me- Okay. So the next paragraph completely shifts gears. So they're just like, yeah, Kung Lao had some other shit he had to do. Um, Raiden didn't tell him what it was, and Kung Lao was like, oh, whatever. Why bother? Why, why bother putting that in there? Only once a year did Kung Lao venture from here, and that was to pit his increasingly formidable physical skills against fighters from around the world, and that time was now. Kung Lao breathed deeply. Each year, before every battle, he thought about defeat, but never about death. The amulet gave him strength and protected him from destruction, an advantage only he and the immortal Raiden had. That's bullshit. The fucking... the amulet makes him unkillable so he goes into the fight oh he's so he's so fucking badass he thinks about losing but he doesn't think about dying why would he think about dying when raiden gave him a fucking thing that keeps him from dying you didn't fucking <sighs> but this year was different this year it might not be possible to hold on to the title of grand champion this year there was a new competitor and from all that Kung Lao had seen and heard, he knew that this year it was possible he might lose. Kung Lao turned and faced the temple. It would bother him to be beaten, but it would be trouble. But it would trouble him more deeply if the amulet were to fall into the hands of someone evil. He wished he could return the amulet to Raiden, but he knew that wasn't possible. What a god has given to mortals can never be returned, for it is no longer deistic. Even to touch it would make the god no longer a god, but a mortal. There was no choice, even though his decisions might well result in losing more than just the tournament. What Kung Lao was about to do might well cost him his life. And with, and with his death, the age of enlightenment that Raiden hoped for might also come to an end. Walking across the ledge to the cliffside adjoining the entrance to the temple, Kung Lao cocked his elbows at his sides, faced the rock, collected his thoughts, and with a flashing burst sent the knuckles of his left fist and then his right fist driving against the gray stone. Shards of rock went flying in all directions as Kung Lao's expression remained unchanged, the flesh of his hands unbloodied. He cocked his elbows again and once more his fist flew out, blasting away more pieces of stone. A third series of blows completed the task. When Kung Lao was finished, he gently removed the amulet from around his neck, lay it in the niche he had opened, picked up the pieces of rock, and carefully replaced them so that the precious talisman was completely hidden. He looked at the rocks for a long moment, said a silent prayer, and then slowly, very slowly, 
he walked to the temple. Feeling as though an essential piece of him had died, but knowing that he had done the right thing, Kung Lao began to gather his few belongings for the week-long journey to Mount Takahashi. So he fucking took off the unkillable necklace gimmick and hid it in a stone wall? Why did he take it off? Is that the thing Raiden was just like, oh, you're going to have to do some shit. I'm not going to tell you what it is. And Kung Lao's like, I'm not going to fucking ask. <sighs> All right. Chapter 7. <laughs> I hope you guys are having a good time. Shimura Island was a strange place, hidden behind fog that seemed to keep bright sunlight, seabirds, and even the turbulent waters at bay. A forbidden mass in a glass-smooth sea, Shimura was lit by the hazy sun and seemed always to be cold. At least, that was how it appeared to Kung Lao. He never bothered to ask what the other participants thought, since it was a bad idea to talk to them at all. These were people who had to fight. Getting to know them as individuals would only make it more difficult to attack them as opponents. When he had to strike someone's wrist, possibly breaking it, he didn't want to know that that was the hand of a person used to earn his living as a tailor or to create beauty as a painter. People came here to compete in the greatest tournament in the world, to put their skills against worthy opponents, and that was all Kung Lao needed to know. During the tournament, the master of the island, the curious Shang Tsung, sent paddle-driven junks to shore to collect the participants. The boats came twice each day for two days prior to the beginning of the matches. The boats came twice each day for the two days prior to the beginning of the matches. Couldn't you have said they came twice a day on the weekend before the matches? You had to put day twice, four words apart? <sighs> and the temporary huts were erected with food and drink for the combatants' use while they waited, as well as a stable for horses and mules. Kung Lao arrived on foot the night before Mortal Kombat was to begin. He had made the journey 13 times, and he knew the roads well though he found it more tiring this time to keep up the pace. He knew why. It wasn't that he was older, for the victor of Mortal Kombat did not age for the intervening year, and Kung Lao had not aged for a dozen years plus one. <laughs> oh man, with the fucking stupid terms this book uses, I wish they would have just said Baker's Dozen right there. <laughs> He experienced this unusual fatigue because he had left his amulet behind. That did not bode well for the contest ahead, though Kung Lao had resolved to fight harder than ever against the mostly familiar adversaries, all of whom were older than ever. But, year, but this year, it was the unfamiliar adversaries that worried him. In his spectacular but curio curiously veiled way... Let's, let's just take this paragraph again because I don't like the way it's coming out. But this year, it was the unfamiliar adversaries that worried him. In his spectacular but curiously veiled way, Raiden had come to Kung Lao just two days before. Appearing in a burst of lightning that shot from a clear sky, the Thunder God had said only, An image of Tien will be present on Takahashi, and not as a friend. Since the only images of Tien showed multi-limbed creatures, Kung Lao had wondered if more than the usual black magic would be afoot. If the mysterious Shang Tsung had something new in store at his sprawling and resplendent temple. It wouldn't surprise him. For 13 years, Shang Tsung had faced Kung Lao in the final round of the Mortal Kombat. That's what it says. Had faced Kung Lao in the final round of the Mortal Kombat. There's no tournament. And Kung Lao had won each time. After losing, Shang Tsung would present the winner with the Shaolin Benediction of Victory and then leave without another word. And each year that Kung Lao had returned, their host had seemed considerably older, leaner, and much more wrinkled, his eyes less lustrous and his hair whiter. Kung Lao sat on the shore, first under the setting sun and later beneath the stars, and waited for the boat. He looked at the white band he'd tied around his wrist, the cloth he had found in the village square so many years ago. If he couldn't have his amulet, he wanted this token this invisible message that had sent him on his journey to Mount Ifukube. He looked out at the moonlit fog, rolling and gleaming on the sea. It had never bothered Kung Lao that he won the combat with the help of the amulet. It just says, the combat. Not the tournament, the combat. 
So many of the participants came armed with magic, some in the form of talismans, other in the form of blows powered by otherworldly strength, that the amulet was necessary just to stay even with them. Shang Tsung himself had... Sh take two. Shang Tsung himself had reserves of energy that were formidable, and not of this world, with flame and fog at his command. Without the lightning and blinding sunshine of Raiden stored in the amulet, Kung Lao could never have defeated Shang Tsung once, let alone 13 times. So why the fuck did he take the amulet off? Raiden didn't tell him to do it. Raiden didn't tell him anything. Kung Lao's like, oh, maybe this is what Raiden meant. He took the fucking thing off. And get, spoiler, he's gonna die. Because he's gonna fight fucking Goro. The multi-limbed Tien, an image of him, it's gonna be fucking Goro. Goro's gonna kill him. Goro's way more badass than an old fucking Shang Tsung. And fucking Kung Lao is thinking like, oh, I never could have beat him without this bullshit. But I'm going to take the bullshit off. Fuck out of here. Well, anyway. You mustn't think like that, he warned himself. Though he would be participating without magic for the first time, Kung Lao still had his skills and his own inner resources. And that had always accounted for a great deal. If he couldn't tire Shang Tsung, or outlast his blasts of fire and blinding mist, he would have to defeat him quickly, before those powers could be brought to bear. The prow of the junk with its distinctive dragon had eased through the fog and came toward the shore like a sea serpent. It bucked and bobbed on the waves, the sea seeming to hiss each time the sharp stem of the vessel sent it spraying upward, the foam rising up past the nose of the dragon, like wisps of smoke. Kung Lao rose and collected his leather suitcase, neither acknowledging nor looking at the two other combatants who had moved from the huts to the shore. When the boat neared the shore, it turned starboard side in, and a pair of black cloaked figures lowered a plank to the sea. To the sand, sorry. Their faces hidden beneath hoods, the figures worked quickly while seemingly to move slowly. Let's look at that again. Their faces hidden beneath hoods, the figures worked quickly while seeming to move slowly. Okay, it makes a little more sense when I slow down. As though they were outside our time frame, yet somehow inhabiting it. Though he was closest to the plank, Kung Lao permitted the other two men to board first, a courtesy he had never been able to shake. As soon as they boarded, even before the plank was raised, the vessel started to back toward the island. The tournament was nothing if not efficient. From the moment the first guest arrived at shore, to the instant the last one had departed. After six days of travel, it felt good to sit and be carried. Kung Lao sat on a mat on the heaving deck, enjoying the motion as the junk approached and was swallowed up by the fog, then quickly settled down and sailed swiftly and evenly on the calm seas when it emerged. This, this term of calling a boat junk is strange to me. I've never, I've never heard that in my life. Enjoying the motion as the junk approached and was swallowed up by the f It's very weird. Have you guys ever heard of a boat being called, a, like, a junk? That seems fucking strange to me. Let's get back into it. We gotta get through this. The vessel eased into a semicircular wharf that, when seen from the top of the temple, suggested the dragon head motif on the bow. What? The vessel eased into a semicircular wharf that, when seen from the top of the temple, suggested the dragon head motif on the bow. On the bow. Suggested the dragon head motif on the bow. What, what did it suggest about it? We know it's, it's... Why am I trying to pick it apart? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't fucking make sense. I'm just gonna let it go. Or maybe it was a trick of the light from the lanterns that had lined the dock. Kung Lao- That's not a complete sentence. <laughs> Kung Lao had discovered that the island was full of illusions like that, though he was at a loss to explain them. Upon reaching the shore, the crews of the ships didn't disembark, though they appeared to vanish. The new arrivals were met by young men in white cloaks who carried their bags up the long, winding mountain road to the temple. The combatants rode mules in front of them and noted that the road didn't seem to wind quite so much in the ascent as it appeared to from the shore. This is some Lovecraftian shit again. It's like some shit looks 
a certain way from far away and you get up close and you find out that it's really not that at all. Very Lovecraftian. The animals knew the way and didn't need to be prodded, something that always amazed Kung Lao, for mules weren't especially clever or cooperative. He suspected enchantment here as well. For one year he had asked Raiden to send a lightning bolt during the climb, and he'd seen in lightning... <sighs> that one was my fault, guys. I'm not going to blame the book for that. I was reading a sentence, and when I went to the next line, I went back to the first line. We're just going to take that one again. I don't blame the book. I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it a break there. He suspect. He. <laughs> I'm having a stroke. Take three. He suspected enchantment here as well. For one year, he had asked Raiden to send a lightning bolt during the climb, and he'd seen in the flash not the head of a mule, but the likeness of a dragon. The recurrence of the image didn't surprise Kung Lao. The nation honored many kinds of lung, or dragons. There were imperial dragons, which symbolized the emperor, and there were only and they were the That's there were imperial dragons which symbolized the emperor, and were the only ones which were allowed to have five talons on each paw. The rest had four. The celestial dragons stood guard over the abode of the gods, and the spiritual dragons helped Tian and his deities tend to the winds and rains. The earth dragons looked after the soil, the rivers, and the seas, and the ferocious treasure dragons guarded the wealth that belonged to the gods and demons. That was all one sentence, guys. The dragon of Shimura Island, with its horse-like head and sharp frills that curled up from its long neck and head, was a treasure dragon. As the temple and palace came into view, perched on the edge of a low cliff of the mountain, moonlight gave it a ghostly cast and Kung Lao felt a chill. Something was different this time, and it wasn't just the absence of his amulet. He felt an ominous presence that he had never felt before. A new combatant, perhaps. He looked toward the two tall pagodas that were the palace living quarters. His eyes were searching the open windows and looking for shadows on the drawn shades. But he found nothing out of the ordinary. His gaze shifted to the imposing marble and gold palace between them and with its torch-lit crowds of life-size jade princesses and ivory treasure dragons, its alabaster bowmen and giant onyx steeds and war chariots, and then to the older, darker, low-lying temple in the front that was all one sentence. Just in case you were wondering. Nowhere did Kung Lao see anything, but something was most definitely there. Something powerful and something dangerous. Something not of this world. Good God, man. We're about to go into chapter eight. I need to take a sip of water. You know what I'm saying? Because my voice, my voice is wearing out. You guys don't know. Because how could you know? But it's currently 3.13 in the morning. <laughs> I purposely waited until very late. To record this, because I figured if I was a little punchy from being up all day after working in the morning, that it would be a little more funny. And maybe that's why I'm getting so much more frustrated this go-around, but I feel like the book is just getting worse. <laughs> from a writing standpoint. Alright, man. Here we go at chapter 8. <laughs> We're still only on page 63. <laughs> Outwardly, Shang Tsung was calm as ever as he uttered the words that kept the door to his laboratory locked. Inwardly, however, he was in agony. His long, dry, white hair hung in a sheet down his back, and his skin, once as smooth as the seas that surrounded his island, was a mesh of fine lines and fragile creases. Though his posture was still ramrod straight and his eyes were as clear as ever, it was obvious that he lived under a great weight. I am to be admitted, he said in the gentlest whisper. Well, see, how was I supposed to know he was whispering? I am to be admitted, he said in the gentlest whisper. Open, open, open. A row of bolts clacked open on the inside of the door, and the massive stone slab moved inward, slowly on hinges the size of Shang Tsung's forearms. Shang slid inside, turned, and said, I am inside. Shut, shut, shut. At that, the door stopped opening and began to move in the other direction. When it was shut, the row of seven thick bolts slapped shut by themselves, one after the other. 
Shang Tsung turned and faced the brazier that burned without burning. What? Shang Tsung turned and faced the brazier that burned without burning in the midst of the old circle he'd created on the floor in the center of the room. It burned without burning? I think I get what he's trying to say. Is he trying to say that it's on fire, but it's not, like, deteriorating? That it's not losing any of its physical form as the fire takes it over? Any sort of description, any sort of effort at all to really paint a picture of what the fuck you're trying to say here, Jeff Rovin, would have kept you from saying, burned without burning, you fucking asshole. <laughs> In there, in the portal between the Mother Realm and Outworld, time stood still. The flame was frozen, like a red frond. What the fuck is a frond? F-R-O-N-D. I'm gonna fucking, we're gonna look that up right now. A frond. This fucking, this episode's getting, this is getting bullshit. <laughs> F-R-O-N-D. Google that shit. What do we got here? It would help if I could fucking spell it right. I've got Jeff fucking Roven disease. <sighs> okay, it's a noun. The leaf or leaf-like part of the palm, fern, or similar plant. <laughs> okay, so now that we know what that is, let's take that again. Fuck, where are we? <laughs> now I lost it. In there, in the portal between the Mother Realm and Outworld, time stood still. The flame was frozen like a red frond, still providing illumination. Though no fuel was consumed, the flame was frozen like a red frond, still providing illumination, though no fuel was consumed. The flame was frozen like a red palm of a leaf, still pro it, do it doesn't make any sense. We looked up the word, we put it into practice, we tried to deconstruct the sentence, it doesn't make any fucking sense. The powdery circle was also where he'd made it, though it was covered with a crawling, greasy, and dull amber film, the essence of the poor demon that Shao Kahn had sent there 13 years before. So we went back in time now. They didn't give us any inkling until right now, but we're back in time. Shang Tsung approached the circle, and as soon as he came near enough for his body to heat activate the powder, whatever that means, Time there resumed. The flame crackled anew. Motes of dust that had been suspended in the air began to move, and the room was filled with a moan that was both mis miserable and mad. So this is a really long... Okay, I think we have Ruth A talking to Shang Tsung here. I don't remember what Ruth A sounded like, but uh, we're just going to do our best. Shang! Good evening, Ruth A. Is that how Shang Tsung sounded? I don't remember now. When? When? Today, Ruthay, the wizard said as he reached the circle. Thanks to you, today. Today! The voice sighed, then cackled, then sobbed. I can go back today. I hope so, Shang Tsung said solemnly as he stepped inside the sacred portal. I do hope so. For 13 years, it had been a matter of the most stubborn pride. After remembering who he was and vowing to serve Shao Kahn, Shang Tsung had gone to the mainland, used a bamboo splinter to slit the throats of lone travelers, and with a magic spell provided by Ruthe, snared their departing souls and brought them to the island to begin enlarging the rift between the worlds. But much to his surprise and disappointment, breach could not be widened. In this time before isolation, imprisonment, and homesickness, Ugh. that's what that water did to me. You see that right there? <laughs> In this time before isolation, imprisonment, I'm losing it, guys. My fucking, it's because it's almost 3.30 in the morning now. My mouth isn't moving the way I want it to. We're going to take this sentence one more time. Are you ready? In this time before isolation, imprisonment, and homesickness had driven him quite mad, Ruthe had told him that not every soul could be used to open the doorway sufficiently to accommodate Shao Kahn and his hordes of demons and furies. Only some of them would work. 
Why wasn't I told this before? Shang Tsung remembered, snarling at the demon. Because only experience teaches some lessons, Ruth A had replied. This is weird. These quotes here from them are italicized, but they're not in quotations. It doesn't, it, that doesn't make any sense. That goes against all the formatting that we've had so far. The fool of a demon wasn't right about many things, but he'd been right about that. Even Ruthe had known that only selected souls could be used. Not until Shang Tsung went ashore, waited months to find and kill a warrior, a teacher, and a holy man, and sent their souls through the doorway, did he and Ruthe know that only the souls of great fighters could be used to expand the portal. Alas, he realized that finding them would take time. Using, ex using an explosive powder, Shang Tsung destroyed a floating kitchen that had been making its way along the coast and captured the souls of the seven drowning cooks. Cloaking them and making them his slaves, he put the supernatural entities to work rebuilding the ancient Shaolin temple on the island and then enlarging it to clear... This is all one sentence! And then enlarging it to include a palace and the twin pagodas. While they worked, using magic to excavate, cut, and place the stones, Shang concentrated on finding a means to bring the world's boldest fighters to him, to get them to Shimura Island, where their souls could be hurried, still fresh, to the temple and used to weaken beyond repair the barrier between the dimensions. He came up with the idea for mortal combat, and it should have worked. Through dreams, Shang Tsung contacted warriors in lands both known and unknown, summoned them, guided them to the East China Sea, and pit them against the other to find the strongest souls in the Mother Realm. The idea was that he would win, and, in winning, take the life and soul of the warrior who had survived the other matches and emerged victor, the second most powerful, second only to him. But he... But then he met and faced the accursed Order of Light High Priest Kung Lao, just as Shao Kahn had intimated he would. Just thinking the name, as he had now, was enough to make his heart fill with rage, his ravaged and incomplete soul to burn. Their first match had been their fiercest. Of course it had been, Shang Tsung thought back. Kung Lao had not known of Shang's special powers, his ability to throw spears of flame and coils of smoke, and Shang was also younger then, 13 years younger, and more powerful. Kung Lao, had been Kung Lao had struggled his way through 10 increasingly more violent and difficult matches before finally facing his host. Shang Tsung could still vividly see the bruised but almost insufferably proud Kung Lao standing there, with his left foot facing left for support, his right foot pointed ahead, ready to strike out, his right hand fisted and cocked at his side, his left forearm angled in front of him, hand rigid. What a dog shit way to describe his fighting stance. <sighs> Guys, I want you to know, I'm sitting in a chair right now, left foot pointed upward, right foot doing the same, ass on chair, right hand holding book, left hand on left thigh. <laughs> Posture, terrible. <laughs> oh, man. Shang remembered how the fight evolved in the splendid Hall of Champions, in the newly finished palace. He remembered every move and every nuance. Kung Lao had taken a step forward, and as he did so, Shang had spun and clapped his hands together. Blinding white light had exploded between them, sizzling in the air for several long seconds. Shang shut his eyes. Even today, 13 years later, he could still feel the wonderful heat of the burst. The glow that was going to light his way to the championship, Kung Lao had jump kicked blindly, and Shang Tsung did a standing flip to the left, out of the way, his hand still smoking from the fireball. I jumped into that right there because that's how it's presented. It says, going to light his way to the championship dash, and then the next paragraph starts. So they wanted me to read it like that. It wasn't me just taking creative liberties and going into business for myself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Still unable to see, Kung Lao had crossed his forearms defensively in front of his face, but Shang had leapt above them and driven a heel into his opponent's temple. Kung Lao then fell on his back, 
and Shang had landed with a knee on Kung Lao's chest. You can't block what you can't see, he remembered, laughing, confident of victory. Before his foe could recover, Shang had crooked the fingers of his right hand and drove his palm into the base of Kung's nose. The young warrior's eyes had rolled up at his precious, holy man's blood splashed... What? The young warrior's eyes had rolled up as his precious, holy man's blood splashed onto the hard marble floor. It's fucking terrible writing. As he watched it spray in all directions, Shang could feel Kung Lao's soul coming free of its moorings. Shang had risen then, glaring down at Kung Lao as he tried to raise his back from the ground. With a sneer, Shang then stomped on his once foe's Take two. My fault. Sorry, guys. With a sneer, Shang then stomped once on his foe's belly, knocking the wind from him. Don't move again, Shang had said. Savor the blindness so that you don't have to watch as I take your misbegotten life. <coughs> Man, my throat's getting real dry. We need to take another sip of water real quick. You know what I'm saying? I say we like there's somebody fucking here with me. You guys are all, hopefully, still listening to this, enjoying this episode of Mortal Kombat Monday. So in that sense, we're together. But realistically, in this moment, I'm sitting in my room by myself at 3.30 in the morning, reading this piece of shit book. <sighs> then as Shang Tsung had come toward him, Kung Lao reached out suddenly, grabbed his adversary's left leg behind the shin, and thrust his left palm hard into Shang's right knee. The attacker's leg had buckled and went, and he went down, Kung Lao simultaneously rolling to one side, throwing both legs into the air and catching Shang in a scissor lock as he fell. Kung Lao then hooked his feet together and squeezed as Shang hit the ground and tried to pry him loose. Shang Tsung winced as he, relieved, as he relived the pain. The faces of both men turned red as they lay there, locked together. Shang Tsung shuddered now as he recalled the words of Kung Lao had uttered. Some men with... <laughs> Some men with sight are still blind, he'd said, crushing them tighter. There are always things once... I'm botching these. It's not the book's fault. We're going to take that again. The words Kung Lao had uttered. Some men with sight are still blind, he'd said, crushing him tighter. There are always things one doesn't anticipate. Kung Lao was a little goldfish who enjoyed swimming in the pool of his own piety and righteousness, but he hadn't been wrong about that. After what Shang had thought would be a quick victory, he lost as that amulet, that damn moon sun trinket, sapped his strength while he lay trapped in that hole. And it was a quick victory, though not for Shang. Kung Lao and Shang Tsung had met in each of the succeeding 12 tournaments. We're going to pause right here. So, Shang Tsung, in the first fight, basically beat the fuck out of Kung Lao. He outsmarted him, and he outfought him. And while Kung Lao was on the ground and Shang Tsung was about to stop the shit out of him and kill him, Kung Lao managed to pull guard and hang on to Shang Tsung, and the amulet did all the fucking work. And Kung Lao thinks he's good enough to take the amulet off and fight? Dude, you barely got away the first time. Whatever, here we go. Kung Lao and Shang Tsung had met in each of the succeeding 12 tournaments. Shang Tsung would sit on his throne in the Hall of Champions, watching each match as Kung Lao progressed to the inevitable showdown. And then, fresh from not having to participate, Shang would face his tired foe. Each year, Shang Tsung was confident of victory, for he had used herbs and roots to make his magic stronger, had worked hard to toughen his flesh and sinew, had given himself a reason to win by assuring Shao Kahn that this year, at long last, the great soul of Kung Lao would be used to widen the breach. But each year, Kung Lao had defeated him, sometimes swiftly, as he had, had, in, their, as he had in their first match, Sometimes in battles that lasted fully a day and night, plucking victory from what seemed like certain defeat. The amulet helped, of course, yet Shang Tsung knew it was more than that. Though both had the will to win, Kung Lao had the heart of a god. Shang was on a mission for one, which wasn't the same thing. 
clearly it was not. Though for 13 years it had been a matter of pride, it wasn't any longer. This year, with his soul in remarkable disrepair, his body weaker than ever, Shang Tsung had decided not to fight. This year, someone, more properly something, would fight for him and defeat the accursed Kung Lao. Okay, spoilers. I said it was coming earlier, but they just fucking spoiled it right here. And with their champion beaten, Raiden and even Tien himself would have to partake in the tournament. And when they fell, their souls would, but you get ahead of yourself, incautious dog. <coughs> Shang Tsung chastised himself. That's in no quotations and it's italicized, which made me think it was Shao Kahn jumping into Shang's dream, but it wasn't. He felt tired as he stood here for the first time since the last Mortal Kombat one year before. Each time he lost, Shang Tsung had come to this very spot and surrendered a portion of his soul to keep the portal from closing. It had occurred to him, of course, to disobey Shao Kahn's command, to allow the portal to shut and then reopen it when he had collected enough souls. But in a panic that had started him on the road to insanity, Ruthay had pointed out that if the rift were to shut while Ruthay was still on this side, the Mother Realm would be destroyed, along with everyone in it, including them. How can that be? Shang Tsung had asked. It is in the nature of matter, Ruthay had said, <laughs> that the demon can leave the egg or the soul, the human, but neither the shell nor the flesh can cross over. If they do, and the spiritual root of the home world is severed, then the particles that compromise, that comprise, sorry, <laughs> all matter will be torn asunder and obliterate all. That's a, I like that voice that I just gave Ruthie. It's the most character development we've had this entire time, and I'm the one who did it. <laughs> While he was here, trapped atop the circle, Ruthie was still rooted in the outworld. But if the doorway were shut, he would be nothing more than unctuous, an unctuous smear. Unctuous. We're gonna fucking... Siri, what's the definition of unctuous? Of a person excessively or ingratiatingly flattering. Oily. Do you want to hear the remaining one? Yeah, go for it. Chiefly in minerals. Having a greasy or soapy feel. Okay. <laughs> <sighs> Only if a god were to cross from one realm to the other, redefine the nature of the life and matter there, could the two worlds be mixed. Sorry, this is a long chapter, guys. <laughs> so Shang Tsung would stand there with a wind from the other side of the rift pulled at him, drawing him down like a whirlpool. He would resist the pull, and only when he felt a sharp snap or a slow rip or a long, twisting agony for it was a different every time did he know that he had given part of himself in order for the doorway to stay open, and that he was free to go until the next loss. The matter of pride that had been... What? The matter of pride had been that he be the one to defeat Kung Lao, to claim the High Priest's singularity. We're gonna take this paragraph again. Guys, I really can't wait for this, ch this chapter to end. And then I'm gonna blow my brains out. That's what I'm gonna do because of this fucking book. <laughs> the matter of pride had been that he be the one to defeat Kung Lao, to claim the high priest's singularly mighty soul and use it to enlarge the rift between the worlds. But that was not to be. So with Ruthay's help, he had come up with an alternate plan and had been presented that to their sovereign lord. Good God. And as he knelt with his spread palms pressed to the floor, and prepared to face Shao Kahn once more, Shang Tsung was confident that they were going to do what was the right thing. Shao Kahn didn't care about the means so much as he cared about the results. Great Lord, Shang said as he felt, as he felt but could not see a hot, oppressive shadow fall over him. What is it, Mouse? Shao Kahn said. The words stung, but Shang said, Revered, revered Emperor, I've come to assure you that this is. I, I'm fucking, I'm fucking up, guys. <laughs> Revered Emperor, I've come to assure you that this will be the year of Kung Lao's defeat. You have promised this before! I have, Great One, it is true. Shang Tsung said. 
but this year I have renewed hope. Not only will I permit your other servant to take on the Order of Light High Priest and crush him utterly for all time, the servant who is strong, where I am weak. You are weak in most ways, Shang! I deserve the rebuke, Master, Shang lied. But after this day, you'll be proud of what we have done. For not only will the prince fight for you, but Kung Lao has come without the source of his greatest power, the enchanted amulet given to him by your prattle bores me, rabbit. Mastery of the Mother Realm is all that matters. And you shall have it, Shang promised, soon. Go, Shao Kahn said. You have very little soul left, Shang, and I should hate to have to claim it. If I do, he bellowed, you will hate it as well, for your eternity will not be spent as the ruler of Shokan provinces, but as a sore on the tongue of my dragon, Twiglet, one that causes her to belch fire <laughs> over you for each moment of forever. <laughs> Oh, god damn, dude, Shao Kahn is fucking funny. That's good. He's like, if you piss me off, if you let me down one more time, I'm gonna make you a canker sore on the tongue of a dragon who constantly burps fire. <laughs> oh, Jeff Rovin was fucking off on that one. God damn. I understand, Most High, Shang Kao Toad. I will not fail you. Be very certain of that, Shao Kahn said. The prince I have sent through the rift was not happy to go. I know, Shang Tsung said, bending so low that his lips touched the floor. I had thought, sire, the souls I sent in exchange briefly contented me. The pirates that are now flowing on a fiery sea, while flaming swords slice hot wounds that are instantly cauterized. How the wretches scream when the blades are yanked from their bru burnt flesh. <laughs> Fuck. But these souls did not help the prince. They widened the portal barely enough to accommodate his form. I had to force him. My lowest apologies, Lord. As Ruth A will tell you when the poor fiend is lucid enough to speak, that is a most unpleasant experience. I understand, your highness, Shang Tsung said, but I assure you, I have the prince under control. Control? Shao Kahn chuckled. One does not control the prince. One simply finds him a more appealing adversary and, the, and then gets out of his way. Had I been able to control him fully, he would not have gone through long ago instead of you. He would have gone through long ago instead of you. I botched that last sentence. And as the shadowy presence of the great lord vanished, Shang Tsung rose. He felt that he was certain of that. For, through a spy hole, he had watched Kung Lao when he arrived at his room in the Northern Pagoda, had seen that the 13-time champion had come without his amulet, and had about him the chill of fear, the look of a man who was about to lose his first mortal combat and suffer dumb and helpless while his soul was torn from his broken body and used as the first cobblestone in a demonic road. Dan Dan's, that's going to close chapter 8. I'm not doing chapter 9 <laughs> in this video. We will save chapter 9 and onward for another installment of Mortal Kombat Monday. If you are still enjoying me reading this book, praise be to you. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna say right now, the first video did way better than I thought it would, and if this one does as well, I will continue reading this book, but if not, I'm gonna wipe my ass with this book and I'm gonna light it on fire. <laughs> so there you have it, Dan Dans. We are now eight chapters deep into this nightmarish, toxic waste, piece of shit, garbage trash heap that is the Mortal Kombat novel written by Jeff Rovin. If you want me to keep reading, let me know in the comments. If you don't, I'll stop. Jesus Christ, I'll stop. That would be wonderful. But we've already come this far, and if you want to complete the story, just let me know. I love you, and I'll see you next week.